Psychology 101. And there are many different schools of psychology, so Psychology 101 may be different for Sigmund Freud's people and uh, different for the positive uh, cognitive, cognitive, cognitive psychological approach to counseling. Uh, there was a Jewish psychiatrist 60, 70 years ago, Abraham Lowe. He wrote a book called Mental Health Through Will Training. It's an excellent book. He started something called Recovery Incorporated to help people who were neurotic and psychotic <coughs> to come to get his vision of the human psyche. It happened to coincide completely with St. Thomas Aquinas. Human person is made up of body and soul. The soul is made up of intellect and will. This is standard operating common sense for us who have been trained in the, in the school of Christian thinking. But the, the intellect and the will are two very important concepts. Both things are invisible. The will and the intellect are invisible. But in the ordinary course of life, the will says, it only, it only has one function. The will has one function. The will says yes or no. That's all it can do. The intellect provides information, knowledge, presents it to the will, and the will decides, can I go with this? Can I depend on this? Is this right? The will, that's what conscience is, trying to determine the oughtness of human conduct. So the, the will says, yes, this is right, this is what I should do, I'm going in this direction, get out of my way. And the will says, no, I'm not going to poison my mind with negative, dark thinking that will take me down. I'm not going to uh, allow the past to drag me down. There's a whole spirituality that could be described here, and that is the living in the present moment. This is the heart of spirituality for Catholics. Uh, a book was written that was kind of the fountain of wisdom for many spiritual writers in the last couple hundred years. A 17th century Jesuit, uh, Jean-Pierre de Cossard, wrote a book called Abandonment to Divine Providence. And in it, he says, the key idea is, the secret of sanctity and happiness rests in fidelity to the will of God as it is manifested in the duty of the present moment. Living in the present moment and the duty of the present moment will save you uh, from a life of misery and depression. Because many people who live in the past are punishing themselves for the bad things they did and uh, working very hard to maybe repent or overcome bad things that happened in their life. So their real focus is, is looking back. They're on a train that's moving forward, but they're looking at where they came from. And that's no way to live your life. You've got to be facing forward. OK, so when you look forward from the present moment, what do you see? Danger up ahead. I mean, we're a couple of weeks from war with, uh, God help us, Iran. Uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to come down on them. And that's what they want. They're provoking an attack. And that will unleash other things. But I, I don't want to get into that. It's quite scary, I admit. But fear of the future will destroy your joy. Because the only place you can live your life is in the reality of the present moment. If you live in the future fearing what's coming, your, your soul will be caught up in fear. Jesus said, fear is useless. What you need is trust. <coughs> you, you have to learn to face the future with courage. 
We got through this before, we're gonna get through this again. We get, get, I've lived this long and I've managed by the help of God's grace to, to clear the path. It's a way of thinking, call it positive thinking. I would suggest to you, forget piety, forget spirituality and fervor, uh, and commit yourself to positive thinking, which is a pop, pop psychology concept. But it, positive thinking is the very means by which you attain the, the ability to live in the present moment. And if you offer your life to God in the present moment, all good things happen. Now I'm going to tell you something that I've witnessed hundreds of miracles. And you have too, but you're not aware of it. It has to do with addiction, alcohol, and drugs. I ran a poverty program for a few years. And uh, we took in addicts and alcoholics. Some were court stipulated and others came begging to get in. We wouldn't take them if they didn't beg to get in. Parents said, please take care of my boy. I have to get him out of this drug. And he's reluctant to come. We don't want him. He has to beg for what we have to offer. We're fighting for his life and his sobriety. But here's the miracle. If they come in with the idea I tried over and over and over. I just can't give it up. I go a week, if lucky, a week, and I turn back. I need a drink. I need a shot. I have to. I can't. My will is weak. That's that's not the issue. Um, the job I had, I was teaching a twelve-step spirituality. And that was my role. Uh, I was running, I was executive director, but I, I got into the classroom and basically tried to sell them on the idea of the 12-step program. Now, the 12-step program, three essential steps, the first three. The first is, I now realize that my life is unmanageable. I cannot manage my life because of my drinking problem. I don't know what to do. Second step. Came to realize there was a power greater than my own out there. So I'm weak, helpless, frightened, unable to do. But there is a power out there greater than my own. The third step is the essential step. It's really, without going into drugs or alcohol, it's what we try to teach every novice who comes to us in religious life. And it's basically this, surrender. You have to agree to turn over to this power that is greater than your own. You have to turn your life and your will over to the God of your understanding. And the unwritten part of it is, and he will do for you, or she will do for you, what you are unable to do for yourself. Now, a lot of them don't get it. <clears throat> but when they do get it, it changes everything. It almost is like saying, you don't have to worry about giving it up anymore. You don't have to worry about not taking the first drink. It's not about your will. It's about your surrender to a power greater than your own. He will do for you what you're unable to do. You can delegate your problem to God. And he will heal you. He will take the craving away. Is this not a miracle? We had four graduations a year. Guys who say, I'm going to die with a needle in my arm when they come in. And on the night of their graduation, they say, thank, thank you. Father, thank you, Eva's Village. It's the place where I ran. It's in Paris, New Jersey. Thank you for giving me my life back. And little kids come up and say, thank you for giving me my daddy back. No, they're not out of the woods. But after they've been clean and sober for nearly a year, they've got a head start. We've got them working. They've been handing their money in. They will get it all back when they leave. And they are. You know, 
instructed not to hang around with the same crowd and not to get sucked up into it again. But we had a 65% recovery rate, tracing it into the fifth and sixth years since they were with us. Can't do that forever, and they don't all make it all the way all the time. But the miracle, they were pitiless creatures of habit that were destroying themselves, and suddenly they're on the right path. And now dealing with you as an equal, working, earning their own money, getting their families back. So it's it's in the will, not the willpower, so to speak, to stop taking the first drink. It's in the will to surrender yourself to God in the present moment. This is a lot of heavy stuff to lay on you in one shot. But I think the Holy Spirit will enable you to remember the important things. This is psychology 101. The will is on top of the personality. The will controls the personality. Your destiny is in your own hands. Wherever you want to go, heaven or hell, is up to you making a decision, yes or no. Yes, I want to go to heaven. <coughs> Under the will comes the intellect. The intellect can purvey a whole field of choices that will be good. Some of them will be good for you, some of them you know will not be good for you. You have to decide whether you can take the chance of risking your mental health and your future by taking recreational drugs, for instance. You're risking losing control. It happens. We, Whitney Houston, God bless her. Just over the years, got to be too much. The will says yes or no. The intellect presents the, the, the choices that you have. But what you allow yourself to think will immediately affect your feelings. So you have the will, the intellect, the emotions. The emotions you feel are the direct result of the thoughts you think. If you are in a habitual state of mind, I'm no good, I'm never going to amount to anything. I've tried a hundred times and nothing works. Nobody gave me a break. I'm going to die with a nail in my arm. Life is a bitch. I'm not able to go on. I can't go on. If you're thinking suicidal thoughts and you don't put a stop to it, and by the way, there are many drugs that lead you into the idea of I gotta take my own life because I can't bear it any longer. You know, just by eliminating a particular drug and you will be free of that. It's not as though it's really you speaking. Don't believe every thought that comes into your head as though it was you. You have to make some kind of a, this, is, this takes maturity of time. You have to disassociate yourself from your own thoughts sometimes. I'm no good, I'm a tramp, I'll never be any good, I've done this and I've done that. Mm, you did that and it was bad, but you are not what you did. You have the power to disassociate yourself from what you did and also disassociate yourself from thoughts that are disrespectful of you. You have an obligation to love yourself and to respect yourself. If you pursue it for the rest of your life, trying to live in the present moment, it'll be very difficult, but at least that is a guidepost for you. Uh, the secret of sanctity and happiness rests in Fulfilling the duty of the present moment as it is manifested to you each day. 